disclaimer, you will see that a couple of times. Uh, it's likely that knowledge and practice that is shared today will not have been officially approved by each country's official authorities. And they are presented here for illustration only, and you are invited to use them at your own risk. We have focused on the short term, and this is why we have taken this approach. The agenda today, uh, I'm presenting the webinar. Uh, Oscar de Buen uh, who is our past president at PIARC, will present uh, the introduction to the webinar. Then you will take him uh, from a partner organization, a very important one, the ITF, International Transport Firm, will deliver a keynote speech. And then members of a response team at PIARC, starting with Christos Grinofontos and Valentina Galasso, will present what we've achieved in the webinar. Then, wrapping up, Christos will present us the next steps, and Robin Sibi will present the questions and answers and will moderate that. And Mario del Camino Picon Cabrera from Spain, who is the chair of the Strategic Planning Commission in PIARC, will conclude the webinar. And, we, and if it's okay with everyone, we'll conclude by turning on all our webcams and saying hello and goodbye to all of us. I see that some of us are using the raise your hand feature. Please note that we're not using it. So if you want to raise your hand, you can do that, but it's not going to be used. Without further delay, let me invite Oscar de Buen, who is PIARC's past president, uh, to, uh, to the floor. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you very much, Patrick, for this introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being present at our webinar uh, today. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to each one and every one of you. Uh, my name is Oscar de Buen. I am a PR past president for the period from 2013 to 2016, and I will be providing these introductory comments to our webinar today. Next slide, please. Here you have, you find a brief professional background of mine. I will not go into it. Uh, next slide, Patrick. And first, a few, a few words about PIARC. PIARC, as many of you know, is the new name of the World Road Association. The World Road Association has been around for quite a long time. We were founded in 1909, and we have always been a non-profit and non-political association. The main goal that PIARC uh, has is to organize exchange of roads and road transport knowledge and information uh, all over the world. At the present time, uh, the association has 124 uh, governments that are members of PIARC. And uh, we do have also a number of regions, groups, companies, and individuals that belong to our association. Uh, we pride ourselves uh, of being the first global forum for the exchange of knowledge, policy, and practice on roads and road transport. Next uh, slide, please. At the present time, and according to our strategic plan, uh, the association has four main and key missions. The first one consists of being a leading international forum for the analysis and discussion of the whole uh, range of issues related to roads and road transport. A second very important uh, mission that we have is to disseminate good practices and provide better access to international information on roads and road transportation. We take uh, particular care in engaging countries with developing economies and economies in transition in, in our activities. And uh, uh, we have a full range of activities devoted to these uh, countries. And finally, a fourth uh, item on our mission is to design, produce, and promote the use and development of efficient tools for decision-making on matters related to roads and road transport. Uh, PIARC uh, engages the participation of people from all over the world. At the present time, we do have uh, uh, about 1,200 experts from more than 80 countries that collaborate systematically in 22 technical committees and task forces that uh, are the core of our association and the, the focus of the main efforts to exchange information and knowledge. Next slide, please. Well, uh, to, to come into, into the subject of our webinar. Um, well, 
it's no, I will say nothing new, nothing surprising for anyone when I say that COVID has presented an, a very unexpected challenge to activities all over the world. If we look at the figures uh, as of uh, past Sunday, we do have on a worldwide basis, a total of more than 16 million confirmed cases and almost 650,000 deaths all over the world. COVID uh, has become the third largest cause of deaths in all the world uh, during this year. And uh, because of the consequences that this has generated, uh, it has generated one of the deepest and most uh, severe economic crises in almost a century. According to, to current estimates, the World Bank estimates that uh, GNP is expected to fall by about 5.2% worldwide this year. And uh, this will, of course, happen uh, in, different, in different ways in different countries. In the world's most advanced economies, GNP is expected to fall by about 7 to 8% with respect to 2019. And there are other, other countries where this impact will be even greater. Uh, it, there are many countries that where GNP is estimated to fall around 10%. And uh, well, this, this has generated a, a very, very deep economic recession that uh, now the world must overcome. If we look at some sectors in particular, such as the ones that we are we follow mo most uh, in detail, as transport and tourism, uh, as a consequence of the pandemics and the lockdown that was implemented in order to, to deal with it, uh, we have in the transport sector felt a sudden drop in demand that practically paralyzed and suspended activities uh, all over the world. And well, the, the response to this, to this uh, lockdown or to this uh, paralysis uh, will be felt uh, over the next few months, uh, years. So uh, we, we need to come up with particular and specific answers to how better to cope with this situation and to, to respond to it. Next slide, please. Well, if we look specifically at the roads and road transport sector, the pandemics has presented uh, a few specific challenges. They are listed here in this slide. The first is in the very, very short term, how should roads and road transportation help to overcome the pandemics? This is the phase that we are uh, currently in. Uh, perhaps in some countries uh, it's being ended at the present time. But this is a first, uh, first area of concern that transport professionals have been looking at over the last uh, few months. A second question that is becoming more and more relevant as we move along is how uh, can roads and road transport help to fight the economic crisis that most of countries are feeling now and move towards a new normal situation where things will look different than they looked before the, the pandemics. The third uh, major issue that we have to deal with is how should longer term policies and initiatives in roads and road transportation be adapted so that we in the sector can cope with new realities and challenges presented by COVID. As you know, this webinar is the wrap up or the culmination of a series of PR webinars that have taken place over the last uh, several months. We have uh, engaged in organizing uh, more than 20 uh, webinars where experts all over the world have exchanged uh, information and knowledge with uh, that we have classified in a number of areas. They are management of roads and business continuity, road operations and intelligent transport system, freight and border controls, workforce health and safety, passenger transport and resi resilience, and evolution of travel demand and economics. In the following parts of this webinar, you will listen from our experts. Uh, could you please go back to, to thank you. 
uh, we will listen from our experts uh, of the specific uh, conclusions and, and highlights that have been coming out of these webinars over the last uh, few few months. Uh, I will not go into detail as, as our experts will, will uh, tell you what they have concluded on each one of these slides. So in the remainder of my talk, I would like to, to highlight on why are these efforts important and why should they continue over the, la the next few months so that we can help uh, decision makers worldwide to come up with better policies and activities that help the transport sector to cope with this uh, new situation that it will face. Next slide, please, Patrick. Um, so uh, the, the first point that I would like to make is that um, knowledge sharing, such as, such as the one that we are having here and that we, will, we have been having over the last few months, will remain necessary in the first, uh, in, in our first uh, area of concern because the, the pandemics um, has affected countries and continents at different times and with different uh, force so that what has happened in some regions of the world before can be of use to other re regions at uh, later times. Uh, as you all know, the, the pandemic started in, in Asia, so that uh, if we evaluate what has happened there and the kind of responses that have been provided to it uh, at, the, at the start there and have, have gradually moved to Europe and to the Americas, then we will have uh, information on how to proceed uh, taking advantage of the knowledge and the, the experiences of people who have already gone through the first stages of the response. Um, so uh, this has been key for provi providing emergency responses and it will remain key uh, now that we unfortunately face a first, well, a second wave of contagions. Well, these uh, time lags start, uh, keep, keep being relevant and we uh, profit very much from knowing how countries uh, that are facing with, uh, with these challenges are, are being able to cope. So responding to the emergency, to the continuing emergency is a major factor why we should continue with these information exchange efforts. Next slide. A second area uh, in which we need to focus is that whether we, we want or not, uh, over the next few months and years, we will need to be learning how to bring sanitary concerns into transportation agendas and transportation activities. Uh, immediate and, and self-evident uh, areas where actions will be needed are, for example, facility and vehicle design, uh, providing inspection areas, sanitary inspection areas in, in some facilities, designing the types of services that will be provided to users, especially in urban transportation, the structuring of, of infrastructure programs, how to, to uh, make them cope with the requirements of dealing with the economic crisis generated by the pandemics, then everything that has to do with worker protection, sanitary protocols at transportation facilities, uh, reducing all types of sanitary risk while undertaking uh, transportation and, and mobility uh, activities. And a very important uh, issue, uh, providing support to user tracking and uh, being able to uh, see whether uh, transportation becomes an area or a focus of contagion and uh, knowing uh, what to do and, and what information to collect and process in order to prevent that from happening. This will happen and this will present challenges both at urban, national, sector, modal levels. So uh, providing a platform for interchanging information on all these uh, issues will remain uh, relevant over the next few months. Next slide, please. And in the longer term, uh, another issue that we need to take a very close look at is that before 
COVID, the transportation sector had a very, uh, I would say, challenging and urgent strategic agenda uh, in order to fight uh, climate change, reduce carbon footprint, then uh, other purposes that are key to transportation policies worldwide, fight extreme poverty, improve access and mobility for all, and uh, of course, remain uh, active in reducing uh, accidents and increasing road safety all over the world. These long-term uh, policies and objectives uh, will remain in place. Uh, we cannot afford to uh, not to take them into account and not to pursue them further into the future. So as we move ahead, there will be a need to introduce sanitary concerns and see how we can deal with sanitary and health concerns at the same time as making progress uh, around these, these very important lines of policy for the transport sector. So in other words, we will need to learn and we will need to be very, very um, open to see how these sanitary concerns will be introduced in our key transportation policies in areas such as the one listed at the, the end of the slide, uh, improving shared mobility in cities, increasing the quality of public transportation services, promote uh, multimodal transport options, both for freight and for passengers, and then make uh, proper use of telecommunications and transport technologies in um, the, the, the development of, of future policies in, in the sector. And, and this is also an area where uh, knowledge and information exchange will be needed and where uh, organizations such as our association will need to remain active. To conclude, and next slide, please, Patrick. Um, I would I would like to just uh, summarize by saying that COVID is presenting the road and road transportation sectors with multiple challenges, not only in the short short term to respond to the emergency, but also in the in the medium and longer term. Uh, second, that in order to meet these challenges we need to be aware of what's going on and what's happening in other places in other countries in other regions so that knowledge sharing and information uh, access uh, will continue to be key in shaping the policies and the actions that each country and each uh, organization will be taken to uh, will be taking to respond to the crisis we will need that in three different dimensions or so three main, di main dimensions. One would be to respond to the emergency. A second is to bring the sanitary concerns and solutions to transportation policies and decisions. And the third would be to enrich the long-term transportation agenda with uh, the broader sanitary concerns that uh, uh, the pandemics has brought to the forefront. And finally, uh, I know that efforts such as this one uh, that PRC has uh, undertaken over the past few months are and have been uh, valuable to help uh, circulate knowledge on these issues. But I am sure that these efforts will keep being needed over the next few months and years because this challenge will not go away soon. And we will need to make sure that we will properly cope with it uh, in uh, our respective activities, wherever we are. Thank you very much for your attention and I leave it here. Thank you very much, Oscar, for these introductory, introductory words. And I invite everyone to ask questions to Oscar and of course to the following panelists. And the next panelist is uh, Dr. Young Tae Kim, who is Secretary General of the International Transport Forum. Okay. Hello, thank you, uh, Patrick. And good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everybody. I feel uh, very honored to be back to you, you guys since my last participation in a PIOC meeting in Abu Dhabi. So um, I'm happy to uh, provide you with some more information about what ITF is doing and uh, what we will face in the future and what we can work together for the future. So next slide. 
So my content is composed of three parts and the first keyword is new world. And the second is ITF and the COVID-19 crisis. And the last one is way forward. Next. Next. So I would like to stress that we have three different phases with, with us today and we come from the past. So the past was kind of new world. So a world was created by Genesis or by Big Bang, but we can call it new world. And also Columbus discovered the new world. And as you know well, uh, the Czech, famous Czech composer Antonin Dvorak composed the famous piece called From the New World in 1893. And through the land reclamation, uh, we can also create a new world. But that's what we did in the past. But now we are in the new world in the sense that we are experiencing uh, totally the new things every day. So we have uh, total uncertainty and we recently experienced lockdown and we are now uh, in the phase of uh, uh, doing some telework and Zoom meeting like this. So basically uh, all these things are totally new compared to the past experiences of ours. And we are heading to the new world. Basically, uh, we do not know yet uh, what our future will be like. So uh, I just checked what Socrates, uh, one of the, the wise men uh, in our history said, that he said, uh, I know that I know nothing. So basically, uh, it depends on us how we prepare and how we work together. And it's us that uh, can define our future. So next. So now we, we, uh, we can focus more on the transport and travel sector uh, in relationship with the, uh, the COVID-19 virus crisis. And as you see, uh, this is all we already felt and experienced recently more lively. And we have undergoing a very severe and serious economic deterioration because of the uh, total disconnection and total disruptions. Until recently, we focused on connectivity. So we try to connect the humans and goods, and we try to connect everything by constructing more infrastructure and by sharing our cultural uh, diversity and stuff. But now we are experiencing economic deterioration and health became a new crucial factor to consider. We, we knew that uh, public transport system would require the clean aspect. That's true, but we didn't even think about uh, the virus free uh, situation because maybe it was too much, but now it became a normal. And uh, we have a new perception on the public transport system because people usually think that it's a good thing, but uh, during this pandemic, uh, period, basically public transport system was one of the dangerous the space for people because virus can be propagated from one person to another in a dense situation. And nevertheless, during this crisis, we had some positive uh, hope uh, seeing that private sector and public sector actively cooperated uh, to deal with this crisis. And we also paradoxically uh, improved air quality, improved air quality during the lockdown. So bas basically, we had some hope for the uh, uh, clean air in our life, but uh, we really felt it and we uh, realized that it would be possible for us to, uh, to reach a certain goal. Next. So now let's focus on uh, the activities of uh, IETF to, to cope with this uh, crisis period. So ITF, uh, even though we teleworked and we had to stay at homes, we were fully uh, operational and we uh, immediately created a web page uh, dedicated to uh, the COVID-19 uh, related issues. Next. So if I summarize uh, several activities that we focused on, uh, the first one is we regularly sent out the COVID-19 transport briefs. I know that PR is focusing more on road sector, but ITF is covering uh, all modes of transport. We diversified our themes and we uh, try to provide interesting uh, analysis and interesting information to our stakeholders in the world. And secondly, we uh, try to update uh, uh, information in quasi real time in cooperation with our member countries. 
And uh, we, because in Europe, for example, uh, even though people should stay at home, the goods should circulate and supply chain should not be disrupted. So uh, sharing the real-time information, for example, on border crossing uh, regulations is really important issue. And the last thing is exchange of related things with international partners. So sharing information in real time is really important. And we have to, uh, we have to cope with this crisis together because this crisis is not regional issue, it's not local issue, it's a global issue. That's why we call it pandemic. And uh, with uh, PRC, we also exchange our information uh, the platform. So I think platform connected to platform can create some synergies. Next. Now I will, uh, I will explain you uh, briefly about our transport uh, the briefs. Uh, we uh, sent out seven uh, briefs during the past several months. And uh, in April, how transport supports the health system in the corona crisis. It's the first phase of the crisis, and we try to collect the different initiatives and best practices from around the world, how private and public sector work together to cope with this crisis. So it's kind of uh, the illustration of uh, the best practices in this uh, the early stage of the crisis. And we also uh, sent out a brief on electric mobility, taking the pause in times of coronavirus, and especially focusing on elective, electric uh, vehicle market. And it, it was also affected by COVID-19 because people had to stay and the economy was uh, really going bad. But if clean mobility remains a policy priority, the sector can be optimistic about its future. It was our conclusion. And global container shipping and the coronavirus crisis is on a maritime sector. And of course, it, it was impacted by coronavirus and container freight rates have remained stable, but global trade volumes have declined. So which can create insolvency risk. So government intervention is needed. And reshaping our cities for resilience is really important because we have already fixed infrastructure, for example, road infrastructure, but at the time, uh, there were fewer cars and uh, people uh, preferred using personal mobility devices. So we had to change uh, the space in, in cities and the role of the city government is really important. So cycling and walking and e-scooters, something like that are really uh, available the mobility tools for, for us. But that gives a lesson for us to think about how we can really make a flexible infrastructure and a universal design uh, coping with the uh, uncertainty in the future. So next one. And also in May, how badly will the coronavirus crisis hit global freight? This is a brief on the freight sector. And the uh, freight sector was also very uh, uh, impacted. Uh, but uh, in, in the urban area, it's a little bit different because it was less impacted. Uh, because uh, people prefer doing uh, shopping online. And so basically uh, the supply chain uh, was relatively uh, stable. And restoring air connectivity on the policies to mitigate climate change, a disruption, total disruption in the aviation sector uh, these days. So we dealt with this question also. And also we uh, dealt with the question of drones because drone was used to monitor and uh, the deliver during this uh, the difficult moment. And uh, I think definitely uh, this, this could change the perception of the people about the drones in, in the future. And also we will uh, wait for the next uh, briefs on gender and uh, the global passenger transport. Next so next one. And also uh, not only distributing our briefs and we organize several webinars like, like you do, and we did some, some on uh, policy responses to COVID-19 dialogue with member countries and also urban mobility and transport data issue and supply chain management and freight logistics and air connectivity will be uh, dealt with shortly. And uh, finally, also we are trying to strengthen our cooperation with international partners like TUMI, UNDESA, UNESCO, FIA, PRC, ADB, and uh, we, uh, try to share a lot of information uh, together. Next one. So way forward, 
that can be my uh, conclusion. Next one. So every, everybody already uh, felt so many things and experienced so many things and people now begin to learn more about what's happening and what will happen and what might happen. And my recommendations uh, for sustainable recovery can be also uh, subject to change depending on the evolution of situations. But so far we can uh, summarize as follows. We have to add health factor to the traditional notion of safety, as I mentioned. Cleanliness is not enough, it should be safe. Public space, including public transport system, should be safe. And also we have to add environmental criteria to stimulus package. This environmental aspect is really important. And we, we now know that uh, the virus came from uh, un, un, uncontrolled development of human beings. Uh, uh, and we uh, penetrated into the, uh, the wildlife and uh, the virus came to our, our world. So we have to really uh, understand that the environmental aspect is really important to, uh, to, to, to the future. And emphasis on the system resilience. We have to connect and we have to disconnect, but, but something happens, something unexpected can happen always. And at the time we have to get ready to fix it immediately. That's why we need to more focus on uh, resilience, the system. An effective public-private partnership is really important as we saw during this crisis and even private companies, even though they were in economically in, in difficult situation, but they try to help this community and societies and they try to get connected to private uh, the efforts to cure these this, this problems. And promotion of flexibility in using city space, I already mentioned that. And also active cooperation between transport and other sectors is really important. So for example, ITF is now trying to strengthen cooperation with the health sector and trade sector, housing sector, even tourism sector. So transport is a derived demand and transport is a tool and we can contribute to uh, the other side, the other aspects of the society working together with them. But so far, we were a little bit in a silo and we uh, didn't really try our best to uh, get out of our own, own uh, dogma. So I think it's really important. And finally, there should be an uh, efficient uh, control tower in each country and globally, of course. So uh, I think this can be a little bit uh, too broad and uh, a little bit uh, abstract, but uh, I think if we have uh, a kind of consensus in our mindset and we at, at least we know where we should go and where we are going so basically um, uh, during this uh, 15 minutes uh, presentation uh, i try to provide you with some insight and inspiration but uh, you as experts can also uh, give us uh, inputs and feedbacks and so that we can really cooperate to uh, make synergies uh, in, in our in our future so thank you for your attention and Let's keep in touch. Thank you very much, Yung Tae, for, for your words and for the broader perspective you have shared with us on uh, transportation in general. Uh, now let's invite Christos Gnofantos and Valentina Galasso, who are chairs of PR committees and who are active members of the PR response team to present the success of the webinar program. Christos, Valentina. Thank you, Patrick, and uh, thank you to um, Oscar and Ty for uh, their useful information before. Uh, my name is Christos Xenofondos, and I'm the chair of PR's Technical Committee 1.1 on the performance of transport administrations. And I will be presenting on behalf of both myself and my colleague, Valentina Galasso, who's the chair of uh, Technical Committee 2.4 on Road Network Operation and ITS. So our presentation will cover the success of the PR webinar program and the global outreach of the 20 plus webinars that we've held today. Next, please. I know that uh, we have already shown you a slide of the COVID-19 response team before, but it is really through the hard work of the members of these teams that we have been able to pull all of this together. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, the General Secretariat saw a need to share timely and relevant information on actions taken by road and transport administration during this crisis that might be of use to its members. 
That's the major objective of the response team is the rapid sharing of knowledge and practices between PRC members on the impacts that the pandemic had on road administration and road operators and their associated actions. The more than 20 webinars that the response team organized since the middle of March required a significant investment of time from both the COVID-19 response team and from PRC staff members. And if today's presentation was actually in person, at this point, I would have asked you to please stand up and give this unbelievably talented team a round of applause for their efforts, but we are still working on how to do that through Zoom at this point. Next, please. In order to deliver information quickly, the key focus of the response team was on the short term. We recognize that under the new operational paradigm, the best method for getting information out quickly was the organization of webinars and the publication of short notes summarizing the information shared. And while such knowledge and current practices are not yet confirmed as valid or effective, and what works in some parts of the world may not be relevant elsewhere, Inspiration can be found anywhere, and we know that a good idea now could save lives, improve business resilience, and could minimize disruption of services. Next, please. <clears throat> In preparing for the webinars, the team first looked to identify the key issues and emerging trends relating to the impacts of COVID-19 across the PRC members and the road sector in general. The following six categories were the most evident. In the interest of time, I will not go into detail in each one of these categories as they will be covered by my fellow panelists. Next, please. By far, the biggest success of the COVID-19 response team has been the organization of more than 20 webinars in English, French, and Spanish. Since the short amount of time that the response team has been active, it has worked with PR and partner experts from around the world to present a total of 25 webinars, including today, on diverse topics touching on many of the key areas identified early on. Recognizing the global outreach of these webinars and to share the value gained from the excellent presentations provided, the response team worked with PIARC General Secretariat staff to develop a special COVID-19 webpage, which is freely accessible to all. Next, please. I want to take the opportunity here to recognize and thank once again the members of the response team for the great effort that they have put in to deliver this program, our talented presenters and panelists for sharing their work and ideas with us, but also PR's many partner organizations for allowing their experts to present together with us. Next one, please. So back to the uh, PR COVID-19 special webpage. This page serves as the central repository of the work that has been done. Through this page, you will find the recordings and presentations of all of the 20 plus webinars held today, links to the two synthesis notes prepared by the team and links to two parallel surveys being conducted by PIRC. You'll also find links to a number of technical reports completed in previous cycles by PIRC experts, which we may be useful to the community such as disaster information management for road administrators, risk management for emergency situations, and security of road infrastructure, both the 2015 and 2019 report. In addition, the page also provides links to the activities undertaken by other international organizations in relation to COVID-19 pandemic and road transport and infrastructure. Next, please. Speaking about the synthesis notes, the response team has prepared two synthesis notes that are available for a free download from PIRC's website in the three languages of the association, which is English, French, and Spanish. The first note covers the first four webinars that were held between March 25th and April 8th, 2020, and presents a summary of the key emerging issues. The second note covers the next six webinars from April 15th to April 30th and presents a more in-depth elaboration of the key emerging issues that road administrations and road operators were facing during this period. Next, please. To bring all of this home and to show the global outreach that these webinars have had, let me share some interesting statistics that my colleague Valentina Galasso has put together for us. 
In the 22 webinars that we have summarized here, we reached almost half of the countries of the world, had over 1,500 participants with more than 860 individual participations. Almost 100 present presenters participated in our webinars and contributed to almost 50 hours of presentations and discussions. Next, please. One out of every four participants, participants out of the total number is from a woman in transport. This increases to one in three participants if we look at the individual participations. The top five countries relative to women per in transport participation on, on uh, our webinars are the United States, Italy, France, United Kingdom, and Spain. Can still, that still have ways to go, but we hope that some of the work that is being undertaken under this cycle would help. Next, please. Lastly, we have seen that participation in the Americas and Europe has been the strongest. Within the Americas, the United States, Mexico, Argentina, and Canada demonstrated the most interest, and Italy, France, United Kingdom, and Spain from within Europe. There was also good participation from African countries with a strong focus on low and middle income countries. Thank you, Valentina, for providing this analysis of the webinars. You will see more details in our upcoming report um, on this analysis. Uh, next, please. I think that's the last slide, Christos. Yep. So just wanna thank everyone for allowing us the opportunity to share our work with you and um, to introduce Jose Manuel Blanco Segarra of Spain, who would talk about the management of roads during the crisis and business continuity. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, uh, Valentina, and thank you, Christos. Uh, don't forget that all these slides will be shared on our website afterwards. Uh, so you will not lose the information that is presented so quickly uh, today. So our next panelist is Jose Manuel Blanco Segarra from Spain. Jose Manuel. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Christos. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. Short, we are short of time. Well, it's an honor to be with all this great audience. Thank you very much for the, uh, this occasion to be with you. It's an honor to be a member of the PIAC response team to COVID. And as far as the time is short, let's go directly to the point. Here in this slide, I try to present what I'm going to talk about. Oscar de Buen and Jonathan has, has explained very well the wide problems we are, we are now in front of them. And so many countries have participated in the seminars, it's very difficult to summarize all the information. That's, that's my my challenge. Next slide, please. I tried to put all together my view of this in this slide. Uh, we, ha we have been crossing the emergency response. We are most of us, not all of us, but most of us, returning to a new, some kind of new normality. We are looking at the future. In the first step, we have been able, and, and we think with the road of all the road authorities and all our supply chains must be proud that we have fulfilled the mandate. The mandate is keeping road network open, a road transporting service. Now we are focused on the ongoing operations and maintenance activities in road works. But I think that uh, we, the Christo, Jonathan and I, who are members of the, of the technical committee on performance road, talk very much about it. We, we need uh, to review our vision, and our internal organization, to check our responsiveness and adaptability, and something that is a weak aspect in our organization, to communicate this to all our societies, media, public, and the lessons learned. And looking at the future, what we need is to build a better, more resilient organization, as very well said before Oscar, for supplying a service and public value in any circumstances. And for this, if it's necessary, we should evolve through transformational change, if necessary, looking always for a strong long-term vision. Next slide, please. Well, this is just a slide uh, trying to encourage you to visit our or revisit our, se our seminars. A lot of illustration coming for so many countries in so many different languages, all, all of them very interesting. Next slide, please. Uh, there is a hidden slide that uh, we're short of time. You will be able, it's available on the official PDF format, will be uploaded in the PR uh, 
seminar trying to put in parallel the response of the state governments and response of the rural authorities. So here I'm trying to put the information regarding maintaining everyday activity. The rural authorities, we have activity in office and in road generally. I start with this quote of Yuki Adachi, the Tax for 31 chair. And well, most of us, we agree uh, uh, that the first step was, has been identification of critical, essential positions and functions. And coming from the rural authorities' heads, the operational instruction for uniformity, for public attention, minimal staff, for official register telematics, and something very useful in many traditional administrations, the suspension of processing procedures, but when some special right of some individual is under risk. Also, we can see this, this terrible situation we are living as an unprecedented opportunity for task and duties reorganization and also reducing commute of employees. But something that is arising, um, something has said before Christos, is the gender impact, especially on women. We have organized also a very interesting seminar on gender impact. I encourage you to visit it. The working disruptive factor, of course, but also thinking the personal adjustment and new pressures and roles to our employees and the parents in their homes. Well, a new culture is arriving, as uh, Andre Broto has said in one, of the present, in one of the seminars, the coordinator of our strategic team two, and we have been given able to keep all kinds of strategic linkage, but what happened with communication to public and media? Something we said, we have made also is reduction of inspection visits to work some concession and this has this has had a consequence that afterwards i'll tell we have protected our operative personnel and of course we had taken measures to process payments next slide please well regarding maintenance work through the three ways in house contract concession the goal is clear road open transport and service the role very important of humanitarian corridors in many countries for communities under risk and operations have been adjusted to traffic decrease. The first illustration tried to, to present three different situations, uh, how the deep the volume traffic with very market weekends or, or not so much, you, you, just, you have to adjust it. All of us, all, most, of, most of all road authorities do agree in what are the priority services for ongoing maintenance. And even some of them has tried to accelerate some maintenance works, uh, taking advantage, for example, for the decrease of traffic volume. And from Japan, they have called us about uh, the implication for further consideration uh, to increase trend towards digitalization through some kind of maintenance management platform, as the second illustration shows, that will make easier our job in future situations like this one we are living. Service and rest areas, uh, uh, is the question of the third illustration. We have, we have now realized in many countries how essential are they for long distance transport, but not always, sadly, have been open in the first step of pandemic. They need to be clean and, clean and secure. That's another tax in many countries for road authorities. Some organizations have developed apps for reporting problems. And also in Japan, another novelty, this pilot parking reservation system for the double articulated trucks and their special needs. Companies with maintenance contracts or concession have been awarded of their obligations. And before Oscar told us about the terrible figures regarding COVID, well, also let's remember the terrible figures regarding road safety. Now, of course, there is less volume, but that means faster driving. It's realized that there are more single vehicle runoff or fixed object crashes. So it's very important the role of traffic control center and patrol monitoring and enforcing. And let's remember our IARC or PIARC safety manual. Next, please. Well, here are our invisible heroes. Media and society doesn't know, but here are our little heroes or big heroes, better said. Next, please. In my country, uh, sometimes I speak with people in the street and everybody think a uh, hero of people of safety and other sectors, but nobody remember, almost nobody remember road and transport workers and staff. Well, thinking of management of road projects, the key concept is that pandemic is a public health problem, not specifically one in the workplace, but of course we prevent spread of infection through medical control, so whatever is necessary. 
And going step by step, tender and awards, well, uh, usually suspension of all startup procedures for new tenders and a halt of initiated ones. The dilemma is, when, is what is going to happen with the future ones under the risk of a possible second wave. Uh, in almost all countries, there are a lot of doubts about it. Regarding road, ongoing road wells when the pandemic arrives, the response has been very varied, coming from immediate stop in many countries to some few countries trying to keep uh, the activity as usual. Of course, always reforcing uh, all kinds of precaution measures, as Paraguay, for example. Uh, the, but usually, has been, we have been there has been a suspension partial or total of non-exceptional well contracts, for example, emergency ones, no? Following for safe reactivation, and some countries then have decided prioritization of national products or look it to advance as possible. Of course, there are companies usually by turn station due to the problems. What happens with road projects in pipeline? Well, more doubts, slow down or even temporary shutdown in many countries, not all, but in many. So, in at the end, the sector is facing a complicated situation with a clear perspective. Uh, for example, will criteria, profitability and execution of new projects be modified? So we need a close dialogue in, and cooperation from, of all stakeholders and a message that many people think that the way forward is remember to everybody, governments and media, that construction is a key driver for the economy with fast and positive impact. Next, please. Just another for remember our seminars. Next, please. Supply chains are being affected in their productivity all over the world, globally, domestically, and sadly, some bankruptcies have been anticipated. And the crisis has reminded us the current complexity of all kinds of supply chains. All of them, their goal has been, of course, continuity with safety. Thinking first on the consulting sector, such design company, they have reacted, switching massively to teleworking, overcoming some initial problems. And now many of them are in some sort of evil way, you know, working office, working home, trying to decide about it, reducing so office space and spending money, but also arising gender problems, households have to cope, family questions. Uh, we have to think about it. Well, the productivity has been altered. The initial staff fear and supply difficulties, well, once they were won, but then arrived a restrictive measure of distance, impact of the transportation, labor shortage. So the productivity is lower in many countries. But a positive news we have observed is little increase generally in illness and absenteeism after the first fair. Of course, we are keep with delays in materials and components. Uh, not only for abroad, but also for our own countries. Um, some, some speakers have told about some restrictions in the web monitoring, but road administration uh, uh, means delays because they're deferring the visits. Finally, supply chain also on the start problem, but also need stability and clearer forecast. Next, please. Well, I'll go through this slide very quickly. Just slide, just to say that we have been able to work with a lot of other ministries, administrations, all kinds of organizations, like uh, trying to share information, making decisions, deciding, uh, also cooperating with security forces, cops, road patrols, studying mobility, collaborating with health authorities, uh, fire cops. And the last point I, I, I want to to highlight it because in the last times I'm hearing more and more that, that what is happening with uh, the road sites, especially when the roads cross cities and towns. Well, where facilitation of permits for restaurant and other establishment with the support of the municipality was the first step. And now everybody's thinking on the allocation of urban Spain, for example, new lanes for bikes or whatever. And this could be a new source of work for, for for the road sector. Next and last slide, please. Well, no, this is not a life, excuse me. This is just, you I put a woman in the middle of this slide, as you see. Next slide, please. These are some short implications and conclusions that I think all about it. Thinking always in maintenance, in supply chains, and in, in road planning and roadways, but can be also thinking in other aspects. Like initially, we didn't see the impacts, now we have doubts, we have many questions.
you answer us, but we understand that our teams, we, we need to understand our teams better, our early emotional components. We must rethink, we have realized that new normality is arriving, the important paradigm shifts in daily working and transport are going to affect us, and perhaps we have to think in our future role, providing sustainable road planning criteria, road mobility in new context, and communication channels to public and media. I have two quotes that I think are very interesting. And I leave you. Thank you very much. Thank you for... Robin, I suggest you turn off your microphone. Thank you very much, uh, Jose Manuel. Really good slides, very packed with information in only 12 minutes. So congratulations, and Valentina, now your turn. Yes, thanks, Patrick, and good day, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. This is Valentina Galasso speaking, and uh, as, as my colleague Christo said before, I serve in PR as chair of TC 2.4 on road network operations and ITS. And I am also a member of the, the valuable response team that uh, tried to put in place this webinars for you. Uh, this my presentation will be about ITS and how these kind of solution ITS solutions can be effective and can enhance road network operations. Uh, it is very important for you to know that during the all well webinar we conducted, there are lots of information about road network operation and how to. Uh, keep business continuity uh, within road network cooperation. So this presentation will be a wrap up of the most important best practices and lesson learned in order to you to be guided through uh, the whole series of webinar. We have seen seriously a lot of best practices. So please, Patrick, go to next. First of all, I think that uh, everyone uh, will be dealing with the same uh, question that is like, okay, but what is like to be a road operator, a road company during this pandemic crisis? There are like a lot of impacts now on road transport from the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, we need to consider that this pandemic really shut down millions of people in their homes and disrupted every part of the transportation system. Uh, which uh, road is really in the middle and is playing a really crucial role because in most of the country it is considered to be uh, a crucial and essential service. A great number of issues have been raised in the road transport environment, leaving most of the time road operators really with a lot of challenges to face. So uh, we can say that while the world is dealing with the crisis, which is on one side social and other one, um, on the other side an economic pricing, uh, there is um, an imminent uh, necessity uh, of a new normal also in mobility. So the imminent emergence of the new mobility ecosystem, it's something that really uh, gives us like a big interrogation point, a big doubt. In, but uh, what we can say is that in this situation that it's so fluid, so uncertain and complex, um, we can really face the truth that is that the road operators cannot just sit and wait what, what's happening next. Sorry, something just fell down in my home. And um, road operators cannot just sit and uh, wait uh, uh, the situation to calm down, but he needs to act. So every organization needs to uh, continue uh, dealing with core activities and road network operations while they're also dealing with the enhancement and improvement of these kind of operations in order to uh, allow the, the public services and road users to continue having the services they always have including, for example, uh, emergency services that now uh, are very important for us. Next, please. Uh, I use this memo like keep calm and carry on and I can kick I can keep calm because I'm a transport manager because sometimes when I speak with colleagues that are like road operators or the TC members, they all say to me, Valentina, really, we are talking about IDS, but we are also saying uh, you cannot keep doing what you're doing because you need to act first. 
this is not really the question that we should be asking ourselves because it is true that we need to rush react as road operators and do everything before everything else uh, but um, it is also uh, very important to consider that your core activity is always to provide road users with services so uh, trying to making traffic flows go going it's not the only activity you've be, we've been dealing with but uh, also, uh, it is very important that I strongly believe in that, that ITS solution can be a, of great help in this time of crisis in order to let you announce the mobility along your network. So um, please, can we go to the next, next one? If we consider next, please, Patrick. Yeah. So if we are going to consider the RNO and RNO domain, what I call domain, these are the areas where you can see ITS are giving more important support than ever. They are also the areas so we have seen a lot of experiences and best practices within our seminars. Starting from exchange of information with road user and going through, um, through that, uh, passing through management of tolling, network management of road mobility and decision make uh, management support Support. You can see that these are all areas uh, where um, ITS can really be of great help, but they are also critical areas where you need uh, clear response, clear strategies, and also uh, a strong um, help from the IT part. So next, please. Next slides. Uh, I try to in, the, in this slides. I try to summarize all the best practices that we had during our seminars in order for you to have a clear link, a clear link to uh, what what seminar uh, talk about what and uh, what are the main best practices and lesson learned that we can have. For example, if we talk about the exchange of information with road user, uh, we saw a lot of important experience from Argentina, France, Italy, Portugal, Spain, and they are just few, just some of them. They're, this is, of course, uh, not all of them. Uh, but we see, uh, we saw actually that it was very important for every road operators to exchange the clear and information uh, with road user and also that some of them try to use non-conventional channels, non-conventional tools like for example um, social networks or uh, uh, text messages uh, in order to provide road users and to reach them getting precious data also from that, which can be, for example, road user expectation in return. Next, please. If we talk about manage management of tolling, which has been a great deal in this period because uh, of the exchange of money or the, the stop that the, the toll system uh, actually put in place uh, along the network, uh, we saw a lot of experience from Argentina, France, Greece and Italy that were, they were dealing with the um, digital part of payment, they in fact decided to insert digital payment as uh, a best practices during this period in order to allow uh, more easily transit and also to allow people not to touch money. In some cases, like for example, Argentina, we saw that the government decide to have the tolling for free in order to allow people to go freely or other cases uh, where we saw so, for example, that they allow um, emergency vehicle or freight to pass for free. So this is an important measure that road operators put in place, actually. Next, please. If we talk about uh, the all road network management and mobility management, uh, new technologies um, really had a very big deal in this matter because thanks to new technologies, advanced algorithm, big data, uh, a lot of solutions uh, have been developed in China, for example, they use this 
they're using a mobile app, not tickets to, to, to onboard public transport. Uh, in UK, they completely renovate all the road network cooperation system. And in Singapore, they announced uh, all the IDS solutions in order to have an integrated platform to manage all road network cooperation. Next, please. The last one is about decision management support and the decision, uh, the process of decision making support. This is a very critical one, but we saw very interesting and tremendous um, experiences from Korea, Spain and US, where they use the new technology and data coming from several sources uh, uh, as an input for their road network cooperation system, uh, which can be an asset uh, when you cannot actually implement uh, on the road with, and you need to get data on mobility. Next, please. This slide uh, uh, is just for you to have in mind that PIARC has been working uh, in the past year and the past cycles on road network operations and ITS. And you can find uh, on PIARC website a lot of information about the basics and also uh, case studies on road network operations and ITS. Next, please. Conclude. Just to conclude, what I can say to conclude, it is important when you're working in the ITS field and you're a road network operator to capitalize the expertise and uh, go uh, see what the others are doing, developing strong strategies and try to invest time and effort in scenario thinking and planning. Also, if you are into a crisis and try to adjust to these changes, because this can be also uh, an opportunity and not just a crisis. Thanks a million for your attention. Thank you very much, Valentina. So dear audience members, as you can see and hear, this is all packed with information. And we invite you to refer to those slides, which will be shared after the webinar, but also to all the presentations from our previous webinars. They are available from PR.org. Don't hesitate and go check them. Our next speaker and panelist is Karen Evans from Australia, uh, who is the chair of our Committee on Climate Change and the Resilience of Road Networks. Caroline? Thank you very much, Patrick. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Uh, as introduced, my name is Caroline Evans, and I'm the chair of PIAC Technical Committee 1.4, Climate Change and Resilience of Road Networks. So today I'll be presenting on some key learnings from the webinar series with respect to passenger transport and resilience. As noted previously, uh, this presentation, like many of the others, contains a compilation of slides uh, from the presenters on the issues, and I'd like to really thank all of them for their important contributions throughout the webinar series. Next slide, Patrick. So internationally, we've seen widespread impacts of the pandemic on passenger transport, and this slide shows some of these issues broadly. So in terms of impacts on travel usage, the trend is a major decrease in transportation within and between many countries, and a high proportion of countries have experienced cancellations or reductions in public transport. In terms of role and enforcement measures, we've seen that road administrations have had a role to play in providing advice against making non-essential journeys. In many cases, there have been changes to the role, mandate and powers of transport agencies, often fast-tracked in this time of crisis. So, for example, border controls to restrict passenger transport were put in place in Australia for the first time in our history with the closure of all of our borders between states and territories and the continued closure of the Victorian border due to a second wave lockdown. In terms of mobility of Uber, MUVs and taxis, we had an excellent speaker, Matt Douse from the International Association of Transport Regulators, who described the impact of the pandemic on taxis and Ubers in New York City. Taxis have had a significant reduction, a 91% reduction in ridership. Public transport, uh, buses a 50% reduction and subways a 60% reduction in ridership. On March the 17th, uh, New York City banned all pool ride sharing per the Emergency Executive Order 101. And additionally, uh, for taxis, a one passenger minimum has been applied also with strict compliance with health protocols. 
Uh, there were also examples of where taxi drivers' skills were being brokered into other areas. So for example, postal delivery services in order to keep people in jobs. Uh, the use of electronic ticketing, as uh, also noted by Valentina, has also been applied. Uh, so some countries, such as China, have implemented infrared temperature measurements through non-contact temperature te tests at transport stations, also bus-based recognition temperature measures and bus code scans to provide improved safety for commuters on public transport systems. Next slide, please. So here we have some examples of what we've seen internationally in terms of reductions in tra transport and traffic on roads. Uh, the Hellenic Association of Road Tollways Hellestron uh, presented some of these uh, pictures here that you can see of images of the Attica Tollway in Greece. Uh, these highlight the massive reduction in transport usage and these images are those that we've become quite familiar with in terms of open roads. As shown also in this slide, in London, the impacts on shared transport have been very large and the numbers are at its lowest since 1955. On average in London, the tube carries 1.35 billion passengers each year and about 2.1 billion bus journeys are taken. In this graph here, you can see that by March, tube journeys have dropped by 95% and bus usage also fell by 85%. Next slide, please. So mass transit has collapsed in many places as services have been suspended, travel restrictions are in place, or people simply feel nervous about traveling on trains and buses. Uh, this slide here is from Tommaso Bonino from Italy in his presentation, and it shows what might happen in the market in China in terms of the impact of COVID-19 on new car purchases. So in this presentation, it shows a modal split between private cars and passenger transport. It shows that private cars is anticipated post-crisis to increase in use in urban areas and it will double its share. On the other side of this, public transport is more than halving and cycling is seen to be quite stable according to this. Next slide, please. So this slide shows some essential interventions on buses for public transport and some of the complexities around this as restrictions are being lifted. Social sanitization is extremely important as we all know, as well as driver protection, uh, for example, segregating a driver, also the implementation of personal protective equipment, specialized doors, uh, specialized seating, disinfection provided every day, and in some circumstances, no air conditioning on buses. Spacing on board and seat management is required to minimize crowding. So as you can see on this slide here, it shows that on some buses, it is difficult with seating so close together. Some space is simply not available as for social distancing. So here it is necessary to block seats. Next slide, please. I'd now like to turn to some solutions. So whilst future mobility patterns are unclear, there are some growing solutions, such as the possible growth in the work from home culture in the future, and also increase in using of uh, personal commuting devices and more popular use of cycling. Next slide, please. So during the lockdown, it's been seen that cities are massively respacing their streets with a full reallocation of road space. Here we've seen examples of across uh, Barcelona, Berlin, Brussels, France, Milan and, and Rome. We've seen examples of interusing residential zones, speed limits and priorities for cyclists and pedestrians, uh, new cycling streets, pop-up emergency cycling lanes, uh, the widening of pavements to allow for more social distancing for pedestrians and a full reallocation of a street space. Next slide, please. So it's been identified that of the cities that have acted fast during the pandemic and have done this with a long-term vision with increased chance of lasting effects are those cities that already had sustainable urban mobility plans in place and integrated packages of measures already looking at how to make cities more sustainable. 
So what is happening throughout the crisis and what has happened throughout the crisis is the fast tracking of a number of measures already planned for years to come, now being implemented at a much faster speed in a much shorter time frame than initially envisaged. Because these were already in the pipeline, it makes it possible for these measures to remain in place more permanently. So for example, in France, there's been a fast tracking of the very wide regional city network with 650 kilometres of cycling paths being introduced at a faster pace than previously planned. There is also a need for the evaluation of all of these fast track strategies post pandemic. Next slide, please. So from a resilience perspective, as we all know, a pandemic is an unwanted event that has a low probability but very high consequences at economic and social levels. We had an example throughout the webinar series of in Norway, where communities were already under isolation due to the pandemic and were then impacted by an avalanche, further restricting the ability to access roads and resources. This highlights the cascading effects where less capacity to handle one problem increases the risk of another problem. The COVID-19 situation can amplify the effects of otherwise manageable threats. Uh, there's also a sense of resonance whereby nature doesn't stop as we saw in the example in Norway, where in some places there's been further climatic impacts such as storms and floods in addition to the pandemic which communities have faced. And this has led to further challenges for network operations and for the isolated communities. So there's really a need to integrate the lessons learned and to consider resilience, as you can see on this slide here, in terms of the four phases of, that you can see. So in terms of preparedness, planning, enabling organisations to respond safe, safely. So for example, uh, protecting road workers' health and ensuring materials and supplies and supply chains are open. Also on the response side, uh, actions taken during the pandemic, staff mobilisation, uh, the use of electronic toll collection rather than face-to-face -face collection of tolls. Also the recovery side, actions taken to reactivate uh, and, uh, activity and also organisational capacity and returning to a new normal. So for example, zoning of areas to reactivate construction works and also prevention and adaptation, minimising the effects of further pandemics or threats uh, through the use of uh, policies and guidelines and recommendations in the face of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So this slide here provides a summary of the key themes that we've seen across the webinar series. And these will really need to be tracked, fully understood into the recovery period and also managed. On the environmental side, it's already been observed that the reduction in transport has also led to a decrease in greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere, as well as a decrease in local air and noise pollution levels. Next slide, please. So just to sum up, uh, this slide highlights some of the po possible focal points into the future with a balance of needs and expectations with respects to all modes of mobility demand. It's in anticipated that increased walking and cycling could in fact stay with us, as well as an increase in virtual working conditions. However, there is also a need to tackle the challenges that we've seen towards the impact that the pandemic has had on reduced public transport and economic losses to operators. Uh, experiences from COVID-19 has also revealed the need to adapt to situations where road administrations develop more resilient sectoral policies by way of guidelines to enable us to learn to prepare for and manage new inconceivable threats at, should they occur in the future. This means building up flexibility and our ability to recognise and choose the most sustainable measures that enable us to effectively and efficiently return to a normal or a new normal. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Caroline. Uh, again, that was very, very informative. Our next speaker is Martin Rusch uh, from Switzerland, uh, who is the chair of our freight committee. Martin? Thank you, Patrick. Um, hello, everybody, and thanks for joining the webinar. So I would like to give you some insight on impacts and challenges caused by COVID-19 and strategies and solutions from the logistics and freight perspective. 
I will finish with a synthesis and outlook. So I will focus more on long distance freight transport and less on urban freight transport. My presentation is based on the material and documents from previous webinars, especially also from my colleagues of the PIARC Freight Committee. Next, please. As you know, world trade is heavily affected by COVID-19. World trade is expected to fall in 2020 by, by between 10 up to 40% as the COVID-19 pandemic disrupts the economic activity and life around the world. World trade is hit by direct supply disruptions, but also by demand disruptions caused by the recession, wait and see purchase delays by consumers and investment delays by firms. The impact is presumably much stronger compared to the financial crisis in 2019. Logistics and freight is quite heavily affected by this reduction in trade, but also by the restrictions to prevent the spreading of COVID-19. The distortions to supply ch chains vary quite much, as you can see on the figure on the right side. Before COVID pandemics were ranked as an influenceable factor to supply chains and transport by only 11%. This will change for sure in the future. Partly prices raised for logistics for essential goods because of limited capacities. A huge change in freight demand could be observed. The demand for food, medical equipment and so on increased, whereas other commodities as raw materials for manufacturing, textiles, energy, etc. decreased. Next, please. The road transport sector was and is also heavily hit. The situations differ very much with the extent of the restrictions. I would like to mention here reduced fleet in operation, especially in long distance transport, then loss of industry capacity due to closures of many freight companies, increased operating costs due to compliance with COVID-19 regulations, inefficiencies and delays at border controls and ports, loss of profit leading to business closures, then also drivers facing increased risk of unemployment. The cost for freight companies increased also for the storing of non-essential goods in their warehouses. Also incorrect application of the lockdown regulations by law enforcement agencies and unlawful arrests and impounding of trucks could be observed, especially at the beginning of the reaction phase. Next, please. Supply problems have also been caused by hamster purchases. You can see empty shelves for basic food stuff as rice or pasta products in a supermarket in Switzerland on the, on the top of the slide. The decrease in truck traffic was and is lower compared to passenger car traffic and also depend on the extent of COVID-19 restrictions. There was a higher reduction at the beginning of the lockdowns and then going up again due to rules and measures to keep road freight moving. International traffic was much more affected than inland transport due to reduced international trade and border closures. Counties with a more or less complete lockdown faced a reduction of 50% of truck traffic like Spain, Italy or South Africa. Counties with less restrictions as Switzerland, Australia or the United States had lower decreases. There were also individual cases reported where truck traffic increased, as for, instance, as for instance in Ivory Coast. This was due to closure of maritime transport, the closure of the port. Rail was usually less affected, for instance in Switzerland. The International Road Union reported about difficulties in finding freight for return trips, which resulted in an increase of empty trips by 40%, which reduced truck transport efficiency. The reduction in truck vehicle mileage led also to a substantial loss in toll revenues, which affects the financial stability of road operators. Next, please. Working conditions for truck drivers got more complex and difficult. They had to face obstructions, traffic jams and delays at border crossings, especially at the beginning of lockdowns, often also caused by controls of passenger vehicles. On the right hand side, you can see uh, hotspots for delays, especially at the Czech and the Swiss borders mid of April. The delays could go up to two or three hours. 
Individual counters reported even waiting times in days. Truck drivers faced also lengthy delays at ports of entry or quarantines in case of infections. Some counties enacted bans for transit tra truck traffic or closed a part of the border crossing, which resulted in detour traffic for trucks and longer leading times. The big variety of rules was caused partly also by lack of international coordination and led to problems for route and time planning. Also, the access to services for truck drivers along motorways was a challenge, especially for long distance transport regarding meals, rest stops, toilets and showers. At the beginning, there was insufficient information on the traffic situation and COVID relevant information at border crossings or truck parkings. Next, please. Nevertheless, also some positive COVID impacts could be observed, but this depends also on the perspective. Due to less passenger cars, there was more capacity for trucks available on motorways and a substantial increasing average speed of trucks could be observed, shown in the slide for an interstate in Texas at the, on the right side. Also, the capacity of rail freight increased due to less passenger trains, at least in counties with mixed rail networks. There are also positive environmental impacts by the reduction of air and truck traffic and modal shift. Some modal shift could be observed, but if this will last is very unclear. The International Road Union stated that they do not see a tangible modal shift from road to other modes. Most countries observed an increase in road safety, not only by the reduction of traffic, but also lower accident rates. Also more cooperation and usually less bureaucracy for administrative or customs processes could be observed. COVID-19 showed very clearly also the importance of logistics and freight transport, which led to more appreciation for logistics and transport companies and services. Next, please. The policies of, the policies of national governments and international institutions were and are similar. The main objective is to ensure the supply and keep logistics and transport services in operation. National governments and international institutions developed right after the beginning uh, of the reaction phase guidelines with basic principles to facilitate freight transport, especially also international freight transport, included, including border crossings. Also, more closer cooperations between governments, road operators, custom control and police were established. Administrative processes have been simplified and often bureaucracy reduced. Next, please. I come now to the strategies and solutions. Most of the countries eased the truck traffic regulations, which was very essential to keep truck transport moving. Examples are here the suspension or easement of driving bans on weekends or uh, night uh, suspension of night driving bans, then easement of maximum weight limits, so overloads uh, would be possible, e easement of driving and resting time regulation, more flexibility than also for the routes planning, exemptions regarding border restrictions for freight and the logistics industry including also exemptions from internal and san sanitary control. Then waiver for permits for the passage of non-standard transporting, non-standard uh, oversized vehicles transporting medical equipment. Then also very important extensions of certificates for truck, for trucks, uh, driver licenses and visas. After the reaction phase, easements are partly again abolished, uh, for instance, also in Switzerland. With these easements, the flexibility, efficiency and the reliability of road freight transport could, could and can be improved. Next, please. Also, traffic management and information solutions and measures have been implemented to reduce the obstacles caused by COVID regulations. Border crossing truck management with priority for, truck, for trucks and vans was introduced in several countries. For instance, in the European Union, Trucks should not need more than 15 minutes at the borders, better uh, zero minutes. Based on that, priority lanes for trucks have been implemented in several countries and also hard shoulders have been kept clear for freight vehicles. 
then the real-time information services for drivers on the facilities and COVID rules along the motorway and freight corridors have been introduced. This is very important for a proper route planning. Then as uh, Valentina and as Karen showed, uh, free flow tolling showed its importance. This was already implemented before COVID, but it showed its benefits in a situation of a pandemic. The International Road Union encouraged the use of the tier system, particularly E-tier to ensure seamless and paperless border crossing. Next, please. Um, the road administrations, agencies and operators took important measures to provide and guarantee sufficient supply and services along the motorways and highways. They were also provided by other institutions. Also new services have been implemented. Important examples are the supply with health material and equipment like masks, gloves, the disinfectants. Then increasing cleaning services keep the use of facilities secure for truck drivers. Then uh, the organization of rest and service areas with a zoning uh, so that uh, trucks and light vehicles are handled separated. Then uh, dedicated facilities for truck drivers or then also alternative services. Then also more uh, frequent patrols like uh, sanitizing and cleaning and also uh, with a display of the last cleaning time. For supply and services along motorways, information and communication between road operator and truck and van drivers is a key issue. Next, please. I come now to the synthesis and outlook. So resilience of supply chains and transport systems is a key factor. Transport of goods must be maintained and facilitated. After problems at the beginning, supply chains are mostly maintained. This may differ between continents and countries. It is important to establish guidelines agreements on national, international level to keep freight moving. Uh, then also consider good practices to keep logistics and freight transport ongo ongoing during the COVID crisis or other disruptions. Then the wider stakeholder engagement between government and freight and logistics sector is needed to handle such situations. Then also important amendments to the law regulations should be implemented to have more flexibility during pandemics or other disruptions. A harmonization of regulations rules along international freight corridors uh, is needed. The last slide, please. Uh, I believe that the uh, governments, road operators, shippers, logistics and service providers are better prepared for similar crises. COVID-19 will also support the digital transition and push for ITS solution in logistics and freight transport like electronic processing of documents, online information tools for truck drivers, free flow, electric tolling, uh, also truck management. We should try to keep positive interventions regarding processes and cooperation. Investments for key freight corridors to support economic recovery will be necessary too. We should also investigate further long-term effects on logistics, the road freight sector and road freight traffic and their impacts. Logistics strategy will change in the direction of diversification of, proc of the procurement, more near sourcing, maybe again bigger uh, storages. Pandemics should also be better considered in resilience strategies for logistics and supply chains and transport systems. Personally, I also hope that the logistics and freight transport sector keeps and further develops regarding appreciation and image. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Martin. Lots of information from our previous webinars and lots of ideas for the next steps in the future. Thanks again. Our next panelist is Jonathan Spear, who's based in, U in a UAE. Uh, and, but before Jonathan jumps in, please feel free to ask questions, right? We have, you have a button for that. It's called Q&A in English and differs in your language. Use English language and please direct the question to a specific panelist and do not use the chat for that. Also note that we do not use the raise your hand feature. Jonathan? 
Thank you, Patrick. Um, <clears throat> so, um, depending on where you are, um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening. So, my name is Jonathan Spear. I'm a director with, with transport policy and planning with a company called Atkins Acuity that is based in Dubai in the United Emirates. Um, I am going to talk for the next few minutes on evaluating the early impacts on, of COVID-19 on employees and workforces within the transport sector. Uh, and this is going to reflect a uh, seminar that was held on the, on the 1st of July on management, organisational and workforce issues. Um, and I have to say diversity has already been mentioned a few times. Uh, this afternoon, um, but this was the first and the only panel uh, that we had on the 1st of July that was basically an all-female panel. We had basically women from the UK, the USA, uh, Italy and Lesotho all talking about uh, management and workforce issues. Um, so, as has already been said, we have some way to go within PR and the road sector in promoting diversity, but uh, hopefully this was a a good effort in kind of moving that agenda forward. Um, I'm not going to talk about the experience of Dubai or the Middle East with COVID-19, um, but uh, there was a seminar on the 1st of April, which seems a long time ago. Jonathan, are you there? So, for the sake of time, I'll call you back. Okay, good. I'm back, sorry. Um, and I think we're just proving one of the points I'm going to make about the issues of technology. However, just moving to the, to the next slide then, I think to sum up, um, the experience of the, of the roads and transport sector and the workforce uh, in the face of COVID-19, summed up by this quote from Theodore Roosevelt, do what you can with what you have where you are. Um, the story really is of people doing, um, finding solutions, finding a way, resolving problems as, as they find them, and finding workarounds. There was no manual for this. Uh, and, and basically people have really had to make things up and define, define solutions as they go along uh, and really to keep calm and carry on. Next, next slide. Um, so the context is just to put this into, into context, land transport around the world employs about 60 million people directly. That's about 2% of the total. Indirectly with the supply chain, it's a lot more than that. Um, with public agencies within the land transport sector, we have an estimated 1.3 million people across the world. PR possibly represents about a third to a half of those uh, at the local or the regional national level. So we're talking within the roads and transport sector and the workforces within it in a very large number of people across the world. And, and a very large number of people within the workforce who have been affected by the COVID-19 crisis in a number of ways. And those ways have already been described in, in some of the preceding uh, presentations. Um, but uh, according to the International Labour Organization, uh, no fewer than 93% of workers live in countries which have had some kind of workplace uh, or organisational disruption. Um, and also there has been a loss in productivity in the working hours um, with in quarter two, which was really when the COVID-19 uh, pandemic really started to escalate, uh, a loss of five, around 5.4%. But rising to 14% in quarter two, and if that sounds like a small number, uh, that is the equivalent to 400 million full-time jobs. Um, so that does put it into a bit of context, the scale of the impact on employees, on individuals, on people across the world from this pandemic. As we all know, we are beginning to see gradual reopening of some countries. Uh, after periods of intense lockdown and that as well has workforce implications kind of moving forward but the bad news is the disruption the loss in working hours the employment impacts 
are not going to be over anytime soon. Uh, and, and many economists are now looking to 2021 or even beyond uh, for some kind of economic, uh, some kind of recovery of the sector. Next slide. Um, so really to sum up some of the organisational impacts, and I've split these into a number of different areas. Um, so the impacts on operations and facilities, and Jose Manuel has already described some of these earlier, uh, around the impacts on direct productivity from sickness, from staff self-isolating, whether, whether actually having COVID or uh, this uh, fear or this uh, precaution uh, of potentially being sick, Frontline operations have certainly been severely disrupted, um, but also offices and facilities largely shut down through national and local lockdowns and shifting to remote working from home. Um, travel and mobility, well, international travel is virtually shut down, uh, or if it does continue, requires top management approval uh, to carry on. And domestic travel similarly allowed only by exception or for essential purposes. The workforce itself, the big picture here is uh, moving to working from home with varying policies around returning to the office as economies uh, reopen. But home working itself presenting multiple issues around line management, productivity, well-being. Um, and when we talk about well-being, we're not just talking about physical health, but we're talking about mental health. Um, and um, attitudes and, and, and behaviours as well in a range of different circumstances. Uh, a range of contractual and regulatory impacts around, for example, health and safety uh, that we now, regulations that we now have to follow. Uh, the need to review and change employment policies and practices often at very short notice. Uh, and as many of us will know from practice from working from home, this blurring of the line between the work environment, the professional environment and personal space and time uh, and the management and the personal management issues associated with that. And then finally, there are commercial impacts in terms of uh, the cancellation, postponement or rescheduling of workload, um, but how that carries through into potential or actual redundancies, forced leave, retirements, uh, pay cuts, particularly in the private sector, uh, and so on. Just next slide. Um, on some of the responses to those, well, we've seen the rolling out of a range of business continuity plans, emergency management committees, and so on. Um, some more successful than, than others, um, not least because many did not consider the the eventuality of a pandemic as global and as severe as, as, as COVID-19 has proven to be. Um, we're looking at maintaining or reopening frontline operations safely. Um, for example, through the use of PPE, social distancing on site. Again, we've heard descriptions about that in previous, uh, previous presentations. How do we use ICT? for working from home, um, security issues, access to technical applications, and so on. Um, we are seeing, in terms of responses on travel and mobility, a uh, significant investment in remote working and ICT to support that, which is certainly, because uh, it has to, um, replace or reduce the need to travel, um, but that's likely to continue in the medium to long term. Uh, and with the workforce itself, issues around communications and management, um, again, virtually rather than necessarily through physical contract, contact, uh, av arranging virtual staff working together, check-ins management, and physical and mental health, uh, health as, I've, as I've said. Um, contractual and regulation, looking at uh, regulations around health and safety, well-being and staff protection, as I've already said. And on the commercial side, how do we actually protect jobs uh, and safeguard employment, certainly in the medium to long term? So this is very much around the use of so-called furlough schemes, uh, the use of unpaid leave and other uh, taking advantage of other government support um, to protect jobs uh, in the current recession and moving forward. Next slide. So just really just to amplify briefly a, a number of those points, certainly in the front line, um, the story has really been around 
protecting workers in terms of uh, personal protective equipment, the, imp the impl implementation of social distancing, uh, basic sanitation and hygiene, and so on. In transit, in public transport, um, we've seen a range of measures to protect frontline staff, drivers, attendants, um, through, for example, restricting um, entry to public transport or vehicles, um, and, and also the regulation of crowds or, or movement at stations and interchanges. But it's also about celebrating what frontline workers have been, been doing. Uh, I mean, and we've heard uh, about, for example, uh, the, uh, the celebration of, of, of health workers uh, and, and dealing with, with COVID-19, but actually the contribution of frontline road and transport workers in keeping services uh, open and keeping infrastructure open uh, and, uh, the and countries moving uh, should not be underestimated. And it's something which uh, I think we all deserve, a, a, or we all need to give a vote of thanks uh, to those who have carried on. Next slide, please. Uh, and then the other big uh, story from COVID-19 is this shift to working from home, remote working. So we have statistics, for example, that 88% of organisations have encouraged or required their employees to work from home. And we've also experienced or seen the growth in meetings on uh, Microsoft Teams or taking part in Zoom meet or Zoom teams, as of which this is this afternoon is, is an example. Uh, and we've seen those exponentially grow since the pandemic really took hold uh, in March. Um, but we also see that actually companies operating these and operating these more successfully than possibly anticipated um, can see a range of benefits. Individuals also see a range of benefits in terms of quality of life, spending more time with the family, less commuting time, um, from uh, commuting to computing, as, as, as someone put it in one seminar we had. Um, so actually this may, may be a long-standing legacy of COVID-19 with almost three quarters of companies planning to continue some kind of remote working um, after the pandemic comes to an end. But when we talk about remote working, when we talk about working at home, what kind of home do we actually mean? Um, so we have uh, single occupancy households, we have shared accommodation, we have families with childcare duties um, and combining with school and education. We have vulnerable groups and we have people who care for older relatives. So there is no such thing as an average home and working from home policies um, and how they are rolled out by organisations and employers need to be very sensitive to specific individual circumstances. Next slide, please. Um, so some of the challenges which arise kind of moving forward, changing the work, changing the way that we work in the future around some of the limitations of working from home, using the technology appropriately. How do we design the office of the future, for example? How do we look at the leadership roles or other roles within organisations dealing with new duties and pressures in the short term under the COVID? but those which may arise in the future. Uh, and how do we manage our teams remotely, more effectively, uh, and producing uh, the, uh, the desired outcomes and, and, and keeping people busy and keeping the organisation running? And then finally, um, staying physically and mentally safe. Many people have found themselves less active during the COVID lockdowns, um, and there's now a need to respond to that individually and in terms of wider public health. Um, how do we connect or relate to our families and our partners? Um, and how do we balance those relationships at home and also working at home? The, the home is now our workplace as well. And also, of course, uh, pressing concerns now over COVID, but also uh, concerns about future pandemics and future health and safety crises that may arise. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm not going to uh, go through these in, in detail given, given the time, um, but under each of those, changing the way we work, leading and evolving ro roles remotely, uh, staying physically and mentally safe, there are a range of different lessons and a range of different actions that either organisations need to deploy uh, with the remainder of the COVID-19 pandemic and the crisis, which may well go into next year, but also how they design and they operate their organizations in the future uh, as a legacy. 
And just here are some just uh, some examples of what we've been doing and other companies have been doing uh, during uh, the pandemic. We provided, for example, learning material uh, to uh, some of our employees with children uh, to keep children entertained during the working day uh, and possibly less of a distraction from what's going on. We've also given uh, for our staff coming back to the office coloured bands, uh, depending on how comfortable they are or what the circumstances require in terms of social distancing within the workplace. And we've also seen organisations actually reward some of their employees for actions during the pandemic, for example, providing a pay rise in the case of British Telecom, for example, or providing additional uh, vacation or annual leave uh, in the case of Citibank. Um, so organisations pursuing a number of different um, uh, responses and examples there. Um, so really just some final remarks really just before I conclude. Um, during COVID-19, employees in the road and transport sector are affected by many logistical and practical challenges in the same way that employees and workforces across many other sectors and organisations worldwide. However, uh, in many cases, they are also key workers with specific duties to keep road and transport infrastructure open and keep services um, uh, operational. Um, and there are numerous stories of employees doing that successfully. And you know, hashtag transport heroes, hashtag guardians and mobility is a way of celebrating and recognizing some of that. In the private sector in particular, um, there is unfortunately a lot of issues around um, pressures on workload, slowdown in business, salary cuts, job furloughs and redundancies, and we're not going to see an end to that anytime soon, unfortunately. But looking more positively into the future, roads and transport will drive the economic recovery and investing in infrastructure, construction, operation and maintenance will create jobs. Um, um, but we need to make sure that those jobs are green, inclusive uh, and high quality. And then the final point is that some trends that we've seen during COVID-19, working from home, online services and so on, will endure uh, as part of a lasting legacy of the pandemic. And uh, those themselves will have an impact on the future use of transport networks and the demand for mobility. And very last slide. Patrick. Um, so I started with Theodore Roosevelt. I'm finishing with Oprah Winfrey. Um, we are doing what we have to do right now because we have to do it. But in the fullness of time, we should focus on what we want to do uh, and actually deliver the objectives and the vision that we want to achieve. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I think this, this is indeed what we all want to do. Uh, and let's move on to our next panelist. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Saverio, very welcome. Saverio Palchetti is the chair of our task force on road infrastructure and transport security. Uh, if you're there, Saverio, with us. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Okay, so very welcome everyone to my presentation on security and COVID-19. Um, I'm the chair, as uh, Patrick told, uh, said, uh, the, of the task force, uh, uh, peer task force on road infrastructure and, uh, and transport security. Uh, 13 members, I'm from Anna's company from Italy, uh, the Italian uh, National Road Administration. In the task force, we have 13 members, eight corresponding members, and 16 uh, countries uh, uh, represented. Um, in the optics to share information and experience between uh, uh, road administration and, in particular, in the PIRC uh, frame, security is a re relevant issue. Um, but is not very um, evident uh, for reason that uh, uh, for reason related to co the confidentiality of the topic, um, and this is uh, um, why you will see that the information that they will provide you and uh, some ideas and uh, good practices are in general in the uh, infrastructure and transport domain. In five minutes, some ideas, a few good recommendations and on the current frame related to security. In the United Nations Disarmament 
chief uh, reported uh, in the Security Council on uh, May 22nd that the cybercrime is on the rise uh, with a 600% increase in malicious emails during the COVID-19 crisis. Thousands of new cyber vulnerabilities in 2020, a 22% increase over 2020, with a forecast of over 20,000 by this year, a true a new record. Uh, administration, as you know, are committed to organizing the remote work of their staff and protecting the extended uh, network perimeters. In this case, Android systems are more vulnerable. Um, no news at the time of specific attacks on the uh, world of road infrastructure and transport, but it is known that it is very difficult for such confidential information to be uh, disseminated. Possibly something will be known later on. Next, please. I would like to put in evidence some examples of cyber attacks to sensitive infrastructure we had in this period. The University Hospital of Brno in the Czech Republic last March uh, 12, the cyber attack led to the closure of the hospital's computer network with the consequences to pediatrics and maternity and the postponement of a urgent uh, surgical intervention and the moving of acute patients to other hospitals. And the, the, Vars, the, the Varsav Institute on May 28 informed on cyber attacks during COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, documents were sent to targets uh, in Ukraine, in person in the Center for Public Health of the Ministry of Health of Ukraine, uh, catching the full control over uh, uh, some computers. Uh, finally, uh, we have an example in uh, Germany, uh, the Technische Werke Ludwig Hafen, uh, it's a large energy and water supply in the city. Uh, they had uh, a necking attack to pull out customer data. And then the hackers have managed to, col to collect the customer data, such as names, addresses, account, and business data. Next, please. A reference very recommended and uh, uh, which is also coming from uh, two members that are represent are in the peer task 41 are the uh, the website of the national center for protection of infrastructure in the uk you can here you can see indicated the the, the address and uh, you can see there are very interesting um, suggestion, best pr good practices, um, recommendation. Um, uh, for example, um, pandemic uh, has shown that some of the security threats have been changed and uh, organizations that were protected before could be more at risk. So good at risk assessment is critical um, to establish what threats an organization, an organization might face and therefore uh, what security mitigation are necessary because COVID had also a large impact in most businesses. Um, some uh, uh, good information are given uh, to be protected in, during COVID-19, uh, providing a general guidance on risk assessment and security uh, planning and also a checklist, the protective security man management system, a checklist to give a sh to have an assurance system for organizational security. Other interesting uh, um, uh, suggestion come from uh, think before you link. Uh, that is uh, uh, in, also in the site. Uh, uh, a guidance on phishing attacks uh, to defending your organization. And others are interesting point are. A small action that every day uh, you can uh, implement uh, with the big consequences and also exit procedures. Um, also, it's are relevant the guides to working at, from home, uh, returning to work. So there are many interesting actions that uh, in the CPI and I. Uh, uh, website are suggested so and you can also be registered and you keep can keep uh, be uh, you can keep uh, informed of updates of the of the campaign so i conclude with other next slides please i conclude with uh, uh, my very very short presentation with the other references here you have many information that um, to 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 be informed to protect yourself 
to be secure and from the European Union, from the Europol and other uh, uh, private and public administrations. So thank you. I stop me here. Thank you very much, Saverio. So just like Jonathan, uh, mostly, uh, uh, this presentation, as you can see, was not really focused on roads, but this is extremely relevant for any organization, including road and road transport organizations. So I, I, I hope everyone in the audience will find that interesting. Thank you, Saverio. Our next panelist is Fabio Pasquali from Italy as well, uh, who is the chair of our committee 1.2. Uh, Fabio? Uh, thank you, Patrick. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, very well, thank you. Well, uh, thanks to everybody. Thanks to Piarc for, thanks to the listener. And last but not least, no, last but therefore very fast. And uh, um, well, few slides, few concepts. Uh, next one, please. Well, we all know uh, that due to lockdown, uh, that, that, that there has been a dramatic um, diminution of traffic. But I, I will concentrate on the reaction. That is what happens when the lockdown measures are relaxed. Uh, if you look at the, uh, on the left uh, top uh, graph, you see the, um, the blue rectangles. Or, or, uh, you can see that in the first four weeks of June and the, the three last week, uh, first weeks uh, of uh, July, uh, traffic uh, arrived up to 85% with respect to the, um, to the baseline of the uh, same period of last year. This is related to the network of Autostrade per l'Italia, which controls 3,000 kilometers of toll network. So the good news is that uh, traffic is uh, fast. Uh, to uh, react uh, after the uh, abolition of the lockdown measures. But the, the two uh, other news is that, first of all, uh, we don't know that much uh, uh, what happens to the remaining 10-15% uh, in the sense that uh, uh, you see on the right side, uh, this is a, a, a comparable graph which is related to the ordinary road network of USA, and you see that more or less the uh, elasticity uh, with respect to the progressive elimination of the lockdown measures is comparable. But again, you see that uh, even in the countries where uh, all measures are virtually been abolished, you see that some parts of traffic is still lacking. If you see on the, um, the bottom right, uh, you have um, uh, you, you can see um, a representation of major toll collection company belonging to the same group, uh, Abertis and uh, Autostrade. And on, on the gray and in bold and gray is the uh, foreseen uh, diminution of traffic uh, respect, with respect to the whole year. And uh, if you look at the standard of poor, well, they expect a loss of 15 to 30 percent in revenues in 2020 and a loss of 5 to 10 percent in 2021. Why all that? Next. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, well, um, just a couple of, uh, of uh, comments on what, 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 what is, what's for granted and what is not yet for granted and still we don't know what's going to happen. So first, uh, smart and agile work and uh, uh, up to a less extent agile study uh, as, uh, as uh, um, uh, given uh, a permanent loss of traffic and it's going to be per permanent. That says that most organizations now are uh, keeping uh, the people at home, not only because of, uh, of uh, COVID, but also because uh, it's a way to save money. It's good for the community in terms of emissions, and it's good for the organizational work for for households and uh, and uh, and uh, community communities of people. Um, and, and this is for granted. We don't know yet. Uh, if what is happening in the urban context, which has been well described by other panelists, is going to be permanent. Because we know that a lot of uh, uh, cycle uh, lanes have been created and then the shift to that form of traffic is, is quite interesting. But it's, it's too early to say if those spaces, urban spaces, have been granted to those users because there is no major traffic or because it's a permanent will of the administration that is ready to defend that those choices, which are unpopular from some points of view, but 
uh, you cannot open to uh, cycles uh, and at the same time keep traffic uh, car traffic at the same level it's very dangerous so uh, we don't know yet if it's uh, too early if, because it's too early it is also too early to say to understand whether the motor shift uh, with respect to road which is supposed to gain share vis-a-vis uh, uh, rail, including commuting and including urban railways, uh, is true or not? Uh, because the competition between road and rail is at the moment unfair. Uh, trains, commuter trains, are um, supplying uh, 50 or 60 percent of available um, seats uh, due to uh, the need to ensure. Uh, distance uh, uh, for obvious reasons and uh, some 40 or 50 percent of trains are supplied so at the moment uh, since there are no restrictions at all to road traffic individual road traffic uh, it's easy to say that uh, many people tend to use the, the car but well car is costly with respect to public transport as we know and in many cities of Europe where traffic is now 85, 90 percent with respect to baseline, congestion is back. So uh, it's early to say that, but I don't think that there's a expected great uh, um, modification of, uh, of preferences is, is going to be reality. Uh, well, some other um, trends are uh, interesting, but not yet well defined. For instance, prudent tourism flows well, um, uh, lockdown is uh, determined by uh, law, but if, if you decide to relax, fear is a great uh, engine for people. Uh, even though tourism is open to uh, all uh, European countries with some minor ex uh, exceptions, uh, well, uh, we see that um, with respect to baseline, we are 30 or 40 percent so six percent of interest of international tourism is still lacking uh, many uh, we know that now it's summer because we, we have figures uh, many people prefer to to uh, to refer to domestic holidays um, well um, got a couple of things is that uh, there is a, a special attention to uh, the management of mobility to uh, labor forces which is very interesting and good and sustainable sport, uh, transportation is still on the track in the sense that uh, administration and agency uh, did not um, uh, um, stop or, or um, the less, um, let us say, um, well, uh, uh, make minor efforts with respect to the uh, programs uh, related to climate change and the uh, environment. Next one, please. Uh, Couple of comments. Uh, next, Patrick, please. Sorry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm on the supply okay, side. Okay, great. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will look at two uh, facets of the situation national administrations and agencies, and private, mostly private, but also uh, public concession companies. Uh, well, uh, um, NRAs are losing 30, 40 percent uh, of their revenues. Um, the situation is different because in some cases they directly depend on, on the users, final users. In some others, they are, uh, are uh, the, the money, the finance is trans transferred by, by the government. And different remedies are, uh, have been studied. There is no time to pass through them, but we are collecting them and will be part of our PR uh, tasks. Uh, well, what is interesting in my view is that the, um, putting together uh, the enhanced role of uh, the road agencies in coordinating uh, the um, uh, anti-COVID measures and putting uh, together this with uh, a, a wider scope for activity um, given by uh, the fact that uh, the um, road network was essential and has been uh, maintained and granted for this period. So it uh, was a great moment for the agencies. Well, it's a good occasion to enlarge the activities of the agency. Um, uh, intermodal hubs for passengers and goods are a good area, uh, parking areas and so on. 
not time to go in that, but this is the, the idea. Well, the situation for APPs in the, 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 the Spanish way of saying that, or PPPs, uh, uh, and road concession is, uh, uh, well, is, uh, is not good. Dramatic financial shock. Um, next one, please, and I'll comment on that. Uh, we have some, not 50, but in this case, 14 shades of gray. Uh, on the upper um, uh, part of the picture, there are seven major uh, toll collection companies uh, already established and since uh, decades. And uh, uh, what you find in the, in, the, in the table is the traffic decline, the EBITDA decline, and, and uh, the situation of liquidity which and the, let us say the diagnosis of liquidity is strong at a weight or less than other weight, depending on the ratio of uh, funds from operation to debt. Uh, less than 10%, above 15%, greater than 25%. Well, it's obvious that if your EBITDA declines, uh, your, uh, your cash flow declines as well. So you are in a delicate situation. Uh, you have a certain reserve of liquidity, but as you can see, uh, well, mm, there, there are some companies who, are, who, who may suffer suffer in, in the next future. The situation for project companies is uh, uh, really is uh, more uh, important, more severe. We all know that uh, financing of uh, uh, PPPs in the, in the toll industry are based on uh, uh, the debt self discovery ratio, that is the ratio between uh, um, uh, uh, cash flow before debt service and uh, debt service for that period of that year. Uh, the, the fourth column you see where you shift from 223 to 196 for, for the 407, the Canadian company. Well, if you pass through the figures of this column, you see that in most cases, uh, uh, debt service cover ratio falls. Uh, under uh, critical values, uh, which is the risk of default. Last uh, slide, please. Uh, um, Fabio, I think you've, yeah, last slide, indeed, thank you. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, well, take away, learning for the future after having suffered, um, well, in some cases, uh, still we are suffering and we all are aware that without, we, we are not out of the, the terrible situation and we all are modeling uh, the, 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 the picture, hoping that uh, uh, a new uh, COVID wave will not uh, appear, of course. Well, uh, road economics, uh, cost benefit analysis, return on investment and so on. Uh, we have to update and redefine and integrate the cost benefit analysis process. We had to introduce resilience. It has been described pretty well by other panelists. We have to uh, update the calculation of value, value of time, and we have to reconsider that the governments will um, set different priorities with respect to health sector projects vis-a-vis -vis, uh, road projects and infrastructures. But at the same time, we know that um, uh, infrastructures uh, play a, a key role for the rebound that is for their Keynesian, uh, we can say, um, capacity of uh, uh, reinforcing the economy and uh, uh, putting GDP on, uh, on a, again uh, on, a, on, a, on a growth path. Uh, for PPP and APP, well, it's a little, little bit more difficult because um, they are very, the, the, those contracts are very rigid, we know it, but at the same time, this situation, unforeseen situation, has shown us that it's not possible first to uh, give uh, all the damage of what happened, uh, what's happening to the private companies and to the concession companies. Because it's, uh, uh, at the beginning, it seems a good deal for the public, but at the end, it's not. Uh, and second, uh, we, we know that if we decide to uh, enlarge the, the franchise period, well, uh, you can uh, supply some economic benefits to the investors, but no financial effects and no financial benefits at all. So uh, we had to reconsider, uh, for instance, include, uh, introducing from the very beginning in those contracts, the uh, flexibility in the uh, uh, franchise time, 
uh, we have to reconsider shadow toll and availability basis con contracts because they 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 they, they prove to be very strong in this period. But all in all, essential assets assets must be defended. But we can see even more defensive assets must be defended. Uh, we all need institutional investors, and we all need investors who are uh, looking for long-term uh, um, uh, um, uh, assets uh, with l relative low risk. We have to defend in the sense that the risk must be kept low. Uh, Fabio, may I invite you to conclude? Please? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody, to the PR community, and to the superhuman efforts of the PR response team. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I was not expecting that. Thank you very much, Fabio, and thank, thank you for making yourself available. We did organize a webinar on those topics, so you're all very welcome to refer back to that webinar in the past, and also still very welcome to ask questions. So this leads us to the wrap-up and to the next steps, which will be presented by Christos. Christos? It helps if I unmute myself. Um, you think that after all these webinars, I would have figured out where the unmute is. Um, hello again, and thank you for uh, staying with us through our last webinar as we wrap things up for the summer. And we start looking ahead at how we can continue providing value, not only to PR members, but also the general transportation community. Uh, we're all in this fight together. And as was said earlier, an idea shared now can save lives, improve business resilience, and could minimize disruption of service. Next, please. As you have seen from the last few months with what has come out of this effort, the General Secretariat saw a need and reacted very quickly to establish the PR COVID-19 response team to help address that need. The response team broke new grounds using new collaboration tools and established new norms on how to get things done quickly. The team took a just do it uh, approach. I know we stole it from Nike, but you know, it was really about just doing it and delivered valuable information in a very short amount of time. There was a time when we were working on the synthesis notes that the team took advantage of the time zone differences among us and someone was practically working on advancing things on a 24 hour basis. This is how we use technology to our advantage. Getting information out to our community was fast tracked, which means that it did not go through the rigorous exercise of validation that PR reports typically go through. It is therefore now time to revisit and reassess what was shared validate and identify good practices that can serve well in the future and share those practices you know in the upcoming months even though many of us never had the opportunity to even meet in person as we are working on different strategic themes and technical committees the common goals shared by all um, and the team approach allow us to quickly break down any barriers and work together not only across technical committees and strategic themes, but also with partner organizations as well. Next, please. With COVID-19 and its impacts expected to last for some time, as well as having medium to long-term implications for the road and transport sector, the response team and the general secretariat are looking for ways to continue providing its members and general transport community with relevant information. While there's still a lot of unknowns out there relative to the progress of the disease, there are two things that we know for sure. First, it is that the road sector will continue to be facing COVID-19 related impacts, not just in the next few weeks and months, but possibly for much longer. Which leads us to the second point, and that is the time to reevaluate many of our current practices, rethink our strategies, and reimagine our traditional approaches in order to better address the needs of our customers. If we thought before the pandemic that the needs of our customers were quickly evolving with the emergence of new disruptive technologies and business models, the reality we are in right now or the new norm that is going to re-emerge after the pandemic is over will require new creative solutions. Next, please. Given all of these, what are the next steps that we are looking to take after today? As we said in the beginning, the ideas and examples shared here are to support timely and mission critical responses by road and transport agencies in tackling the COVID-19 pandemic. Now it is the time to move to the second leg of, of, of our work. 
you know, we need to take the ideas presented and subject them to further evaluation in delivering recommendations for policy and practice in due course. The evaluation process is very important and cannot be taken lightly. Some measures were decided and implemented in a hurry. Some of them worked, some of them might not have necessarily worked very well. We need to now step back and analyze what worked and what did not work and why. There are evaluation methods and we will need to apply them in order to come with best practices. We also need to start from the viewpoint of the customer and road transport user expectations. Have they changed? What new policies should be developed? What are the available resources to be put towards these expectations? What is the new revenue situation going to be? Next, please. Looking at the success of the webinar series that we have today, we know that it has become a great way to share information quickly and across the world. The availability of the recording of the webinars and of the presentations in the three languages of the association also extends their reach beyond the ones that can only attend at a specific time. We're therefore looking to continue the webinar series this September with some adjustments in our approach, however. We need to continue evolving the format of the webinars to make sure that we meet the needs of a culturally diverse audience. As we look at the new format, we want to make sure that we provide both a platform for a dialogue between peers for the exchange of ideas and information, but also a way to identify and present possible best practices. When we return in September, webinars will be offered on a monthly basis. We will also continue offering webinars in the three languages of the association, English, French, and Spanish. To the extent possible, we're also looking to be engaging with PRX many partner organizations and combining our offerings. To help with the planning process, we have already identified some areas that seem to be prime for a revisit given the ongoing issues and questions with COVID-19. These are handling of emergency situations, finance and revenue and road operations, freight, safety, and urban transport and mobility in the context of a road administration. Next, please. So on behalf of the PR COVID-19 response team, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share our work with you. And it is now my pleasure to turn this presentation over to Deputy Secretary General of PIARC, Robin Seville, who is going to lead us through your questions and answers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Christos. <clears throat> so we got quite a number of questions. Um, it will probably not possible to address all of them, but nevertheless, I will try to synthesize uh, what we have received and how we can well, uh, how we can make the best use of your questions. Um, first of all, a series of questions, maybe mostly targeted to Valentina, but not only uh, on ITS. Uh, these questions, well, two questions are specifically on ITS, and then I will jump to a third one, not, not only. The first one is, does ITS help to maintain social distance? And how we, you, you affirmed that, you, uh, that it was more complicated to manage traffic, which seems to be a bit paradox uh, of a paradox because obviously there was less traffic and more people were working at home. So how can you justify this assumption? Thank you, Robin. And actually, there are very interesting questions. First of all, about how ITS can help maintaining social distancing. Um, yes, my answer is yes, definitely. But let's try to elaborate a little bit. There are a lot of experimentation, for example, about the feature of um, uh, um, artificial intelligence algorithms in order to define the right social distance to be keep uh, in uh, public places, for example. This is a feature that could be connected uh, with the central road uh, network cooperation system. And this feature could be of a great help for a transport operator to identify a, criti a critical situation or some, for example, specific areas in a public spaces where people tend to stay too close one another and in this way, the road operators can act accordingly. So that, that's the thing that we should be looking at, like an end-to-end -end system. So it's just, 
it's not just what we are doing in the first place, but what's the point of doing that? This is the ITS concept all around. And for the second uh, question that was, was very interesting and tricky as well, um, when I said that it was more complicated, I said that because according to what we saw, above all, uh, experiences uh, related to urban or peri-urban areas, we can easily see that traffic decreased, but we can, if we consider traffic composed only from vehicle or let's say motor vehicle. But if you open up a little bit your site, you will also see that the, the mobility uh, were more complicated and it is more complicated now because it is changing the, the variety of the um, items that are moving along the street because we had more bicycle, we had more micro mobility forms. So the, the complication and the complexity for a road operators would be um, try to manage the impact of these different mobility forms into the road network operation systems. Okay, thank you, Valentina. Uh, and um, a, a last question, which addresses both you and Mr. Kim. Um, you mentioned the development of new types of PPPs. Can you elaborate on this? And maybe the question will, made, will be made broader to our colleague from ITF. Uh, how does he see the future of of PPPs in the road sector linked to the COVID question and, and to the future development that we can expect. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And interesting but difficult, we know. Basically difficult because uh, we have to admit that uh, private sector and public sector have, have different genes. So private sector looking for profit and public sector is totally non-lucrative uh, body. But uh, I uh, raised this question uh, because uh, during this COVID-19 crisis, to uh, react and reboot and rethink. So that's uh, one of the slogans that we used for our policy briefs, uh, talking about uh, the reshaping uh, the space in our cities. So basically, uh, when we have an unexpected crisis, then the crisis become the enemy of uh, the private sector and public sector. So. There, there are enough reasons to uh, collaborate between two, uh, two different uh, chains. So I would say um, maybe at the beginning, we have to react immediately how we have to uh, bring uh, more stability to our community. So in that stage, basically, there is no, uh, no uh, benefit of uh, distinguishing uh, uh, private or public sector uh, in, in any ways, because we have to bring stability back first. And when we have more stability, we have to reboot in collaborating uh, with uh, each sector. And then uh, if we have more stability, then we have to uh, decide what to do about regulations and uh, resilience systems in the future. So basically that's uh, the basic scheme of our logical thinking about how to uh, cope with this uh, private sector and uh, public sector cooperation. But uh, in the long term, uh, we know that both are the components of a community and society, but uh, sometimes we uh, fight or cooperate and collaborate. But uh, anyway, uh, we learned a lesson uh, during this uh, crisis that we have to uh, set up a resilient system and smooth cooperation system between two different sectors. That's, that's why I mentioned that in this context. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kim. Maybe two other questions to you uh, from your, let's say, high level and uh, worldwide position. Uh, can, do you already have an idea of what the long term impacts of the crisis on transport, that is on demand, mode sharing, uh, environment, what well, all kind of broad issues could be? Uh, and then I will have another one, which is a bit more provocative. Yeah. Yeah, of course, impact on climate uh, change issue is quite clear because we really felt that the goal can be achieved because during the uh, 50, 55 day lockdown in Paris, for example, everyone was really surprised to find, uh, to see uh, the clear, uh, the blue skies with a very cleaner, the fresh air. So we really felt that. But uh, 
in, in reality, basically, we had some problems in, in, in the government and in the world, uh, even uh, between sectors. So, for example, between environment and transport sectors, we had some kind of competition and sometimes uh, conflict. And uh, the COP meetings, always environment people, environment ministry represented member countries, but really 25% of the uh, CO2 emissions come from uh, transport sector. So basically, uh, we didn't really know how to cooperate and what to do. But uh, thankfully, during this lockdown period, uh, ITF launched it a very uh, useful uh, directory, so-called Transport Climate Action Directorate. And there are more than 60 measures the government can use. And every measure provides quantifiable impact of reduction of CO2s. So now uh, a lot of uh, the countries and even private sector and researchers can refer to this uh, directory uh, to uh, quantify the measure of every, uh, quantify the impact of every measure. And this measure was endorsed by the UNFCCC. So basically now policymakers can more concrete approach about uh, how to uh, mitigate the CO2 reductions, especially in the transport sector. So definitely now ideologically, we know that this is a way to go. And now we can see more clearly that how we can get there. So I think uh, this is a really uh, good move. Uh, thank you very much. And the second question, slightly more provocative, is announced. Uh, one of the uh, attendees assumes that, in a way, transport is too cheap, uh, which pushes for uh, worldwide transport on a large scale throughout the world. And with the crisis we went through, uh, are there ideas or incentives to reduce the volume of transport and find a more sustainable and resilient I would say, um, economical system with less long-term distance throughout the world? Yeah, I think uh, this is really a difficult question because uh, paradoxically, paradoxically, uh, during this crisis period, uh, some governments encouraged people to use private car rather than public transport system to avoid congestions and contacts between individuals. But now um, we, we have to uh, think about a new approach uh, regarding a public transport system because public transport system can really replace private car and uh, traffic, uh, reduce the traffic on the road. And we, we know that now um, we have to focus on uh, convenience and security and safety and resilience. And in, on top of these, uh, we have to also think about uh, you know, health, health factors, as I mentioned. So now um, to make a complete set of uh, the elements necessary for public transport sector in, in ideal situation, I think uh, it's not only the transport minister's work and uh, the government, central government and local government and even uh, private operators, they all should uh, pay attention to uh, several dimensions. Thank you very much. Um, also some broad questions. Uh, I suspect this would be more targeted, uh, Patrick, to you. Uh, <clears throat> one of them is um, probably your experience from the past webinars. Uh, we observed that uh, situations regarding the, uh, the severity of the pandemic, uh, the economic and social situations of the countries are very different. Nevertheless, how, in spite of this variability of conditions, how can we learn lessons or what lessons can we learn from these exchanges? It's a, thank you, Robin. It's a very broad question indeed. And I hope that we have succeeded in the webinar today in sharing some of those uh, best practice. We don't really know yet for ab with absolute certainty what really works and what really or what doesn't. And we don't exactly know yet either what are the conditions for some measures to work. So this will be the objective of future PR uh, productions. As Christos mentioned, we have a report coming up in September, which will capture the material from all our webinar and future work from our committees will analyze what are those best practices. So I'm afraid there's no quick answer to the question. Thank you. Uh, another question for you, Patrick, even though you are not a prophet, not that I know. Uh, how, when, when do you foresee the pandemia to end and normal, normal condition in transport to come back? 
it depends on how much you pay me for me to answer that question. So I guess everyone knows there's no answer to that. Thank you. Okay. Um, another question, uh, which is also, I think, a question for PRC. Uh, this uh, when one attendee uh, underlines the importance of new research and also collaboration with practitioners. Uh, so how do you see uh, our role in uh, further enhancing this cooperation between practitioners to address the crisis? Actually, here again, uh, uh, I saw Pierre, I can mention that we have been, uh, our members are mostly practitioners, but we also have lots of universities and experts, researchers who are appointed by the National Transportation or Road Administration. So they are in our organizations and committees uh, and we discuss and we share what they have found and we disseminate that. We also have uh, good cooperation with lots of different organizations. Well, the International Transport Forum is one and we also have uh, a policy to really share what we are finding and sharing that in conferences. Some of them are quite technical such as the International Transport, uh, sorry, the International Transport Systems Conferences. Uh, so this is this will be my answer to that, but indeed more research clearly will be needed to answer what Christos had pointed out were two key questions. What is the new normal going to be um, between all that we are reading? What is it really going to be? And also how do we evaluate what we have found? Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have some minutes left. Some more specific questions. A question to Martin Rusch from Switzerland. Um, you mentioned uh, incorrect, sometimes incorrect uh, regulations. Do you have examples of implications of such incorrect regulations that you experienced or witnessed? Okay, so the, the incorrect application of the lockdown regulation was reported by a colleague from uh, South Africa. To my knowledge, there were unlawful arrests of trucks and drivers, most probably the easements of the regulations were not conceded, but I know, don't know the details, but I could ask for them. Mm -hmm. and, and there was also a case in Germany where medical equipment for Switzerland has been stopped and seized at the port in Germany and it needed political intervention uh, to solve the problem. I think it, it was maybe just at the beginning of the lockdowns where these kind of problems uh, occurred until some kind of practice uh, was uh, established. Okay, thank you. Uh, another specific question to Flavio Pasquali. Uh, Fabio Pasquali, sorry. So you you seem to assume that PPPs, uh, at least in certain circumstances, are not favorable favorable for the state, uh, and you are asked to elaborate on this very point. Well, thank you for, for the interesting question. Uh, the point is that, as we all know, PPP is the result of a negotiation in which both parties uh, must find their convenience. Um, what is very important is that um, in the case of major severe events, uh, there should be a, a, at least the will to share some of those uh, aspects because we are in the field of unpredictable uh, issues and topics. That, 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 that is what I wanted to say. In principle, in my view, the uh, public bodies, I mean the, the, the bodies which, grant the, which negotiate and grant the concession uh, should allow for a, a higher flexibility and hopefully this could be followed by the financial institutions as well, that are, as we know, more rigid because at the end is their job. Uh, this is necessary, otherwise we are going to lose part of uh, in final investors, families, households and institutional investors. And without those finance, that, 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 that there will be not a fair situation for the industry. Thank you. Uh, there is a question that we will not have time to address. Uh, it's a question from, a from an attendee from Honduras, uh, wanting to know whether we have analysis uh, in her region. Uh, actually, I invite her to have a look at PR website, where 
uh, where she can uh, download the results of the uh, seminar held in Spanish. And I'm sure that she will find a, at least a partial answer to our question. Uh, I think that, well, I have not, uh, I have not answered explicitly all the questions, but uh, from what I'm seeing, uh, I think that we synthesized more or less everything that was asked. In any case, and Patrick will confirm this, uh, we will wrap up what has been said and it will be made available on the website. Indeed. So Patrick. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Robin. It was a difficult exercise to uh, uh, see, uh, see those, uh, those questions and direct them to the proper uh, respondents. Barak Amen, I hope you're still there with us. Uh, and that you can conclude the, the webinar by presenting the lessons learned so far and the way forward. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes? Yes, very well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning, good afternoon, and, and good evening uh, to everyone, depending on where, where you are. I have the honor to conclude this very interesting wrap up webinar and try to uh, show you as well uh, how this kind of uh, initiative uh, perfectly uh, fits with uh, PR's strategy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, my name is Maria del Carmen Picon, and I'm the chair of the Strategic Planning Commission, and I'm a member of the Executive Committee. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as you know, uh, knowledge sharing is at the core of PIARC's mission. This has been the case since the foundation of this association more than 100 uh, years ago. And PIARC has fulfilled this mission very well, knowing how to better adapt to the uh, evolving of time and evolving, this is more and more rapid in all aspects. Hence, the strategic plan 2020 and 2023, which with PR is currently working, has been defined with the following uh, main goals. Uh, increase flexibility to attend PR members' needs in this quick changing world. Produce more useful and more frequent outcomes to make PR more relevant. Continue to improve the quality of the outcomes. Ensure a diversified and value-added outcomes to extend its scope to a wider audience and encourage greater collaboration among technical bodies and other partnerships to achieve a more integral knowledge. These are the pillars of PR's strategy. Next slide, please. And PR's response to the impact that COVID-19 has had and will still have on roads and road transport is a clear example of the, of the development of PR's strategy. This response fits perfectly with PR's strategy. Firstly, because of the, of the flexibility, since the response has been quick when necessary and has been adapt adapted to the evolution of the situation itself. Secondly, because the more than 20 seminars had provided excellent presentation that had allowed the sharing of ideas, practices, and experiences, which has made them a very useful tool for road and transport administration. All this knowledge is also collected on a special website in the three languages, English, French, and Spanish, which also includes other relevant documentation, such as related PR technical reports and synthesis notes. But as mentioned in previous presentations, information has been gathered in the short term, which will serve as a, we will serve as, as a basis for further knowledge building in the future. In parallel, we are considering updating the strategic plan 2020-2023 to incorporate issues related to the impact of this pandemic. Thirdly, the wide scope and worldwide dissemination of these seminars on the web has allowed to address many issues of interest, from road management during the crisis to the problems of passenger and French transport, while considering the fi financial aspect, the security issues, and especially those related to the safety and health of workforce and users. 
In addition, we must congratulate on the large number of speakers and panelists and on the large participation in the webinars. And last but not least, it has been a great example of teamwork carried out by members of different technical committees together with the staff of the General Secretariat and with a good collaboration of partners. Next slide, please. But we cannot forget about communication. Let me speak on behalf of the Chair of the Communication Commission who, although she could not be with us today, uh, kindly provide us with this slide. Communication aims to support the mission of PIARC. Since, since the middle of March, in response to this pandemic, PIARC has responded to emerging needs quickly by leading international forum to support discussion on COVID-19 matters related to roads and road transport as a way of knowledge sharing and has adapted its communication strategy to support this new activity, relying on online online activities only due to the impossibility of face-to-face uh, -face meetings. It is, it is a new example of how quickly PR can adapt to meet new needs, creating a forum for discussion and using digital tools, allowing members from different parts of the world to exchange on best practices. In other words, PR can build on this successful experience to shape the future of the association, aligned with a world in constant evolution. Next slide, please. In summary, I would like to highlight that PR response to COVID-19 has been proved as a very successful experience by the good knowledge sharing practices carried out at the right time. This is delivering uh, relevant information quickly and according to the evolution of the events and with ProviSat as a, a good basis for further knowledge building. And of course, I would like to thank a lot to all those who have made this response possible, to thank the grit and hard work of the PR's COVID-19 response team, to thank to all speakers and panelists for their excellent presentation, and also to thank to all the participants on these webinars. I hope the webinars have been very helpful to everyone. And this is all from me. Last slide, please. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much for, for your attention. Sorry. Thank you very much, Michael, and uh, mm -hmm. for, uh, for having attended the whole webinar, actually, because we have uh, uh, been a little bit too long. So this brings us to the end of our uh, webinar today. Uh, I will invite uh, the panelists to turn on their cameras if they want to, so that they can maybe say hello live to uh, all the audience. It's been a great experience. I'm very proud we were here uh, with you today. I hope everyone has found this useful. I invite you to, in, to visit PIARC's web, web page at PIARC.org and also to check uh, our information on uh, Twitter and on LinkedIn. Stay safe. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.